there we go. And I'm on mute, so sorry about that. Um, I did not realize. Um, so let's start from maybe the very beginning. Really fun. Um, so welcome to the event. Uh, my name is Cody Norton. I'm the co-founder of Ignite the Spark. Uh, energies of uh, Islands of New Energy. Um, this event is in collaboration between the British Embassy and Ignite the Spark. Um, with that being said, this event is the bridging between two great countries that have already had a great connection for years. And specifically when it comes to energy, climate change, the UK is an industry leader when it comes to that. They have had set goals and reached a lot of these goals and are continuing to strive more. There's a lot that we could learn from the Israeli side and, and back and forth. There's a lot of Israeli companies that could help in the UK. And um, there's a lot that's very similar in that, you know, the UK is an actual island where Israel is somewhat of an island itself. Before we hop into too much more, let's talk about hop in. So this is a great platform. This platform is going to stay open for three days. Uh, right now, we're here in the main stage. We're going to hear from a variety of speakers. Um, after the speakers are done and our keynote speaker, which make sure you stick around for that, you'll be able to go into breakout sessions that will go live. And there's three different sessions that you'll be able to go and participate in. You have one focus on innovation, on bundling, and then academia as well. And you could go and switch between them. And then after that, the biggest part is networking. Stick around for the networking. It's speed dating. It's quick. It's fast. You just say, I'm ready, and you're randomly paired up with someone. You have a maximum of five minutes, so each of you get about a two-minute elevator pitch, and then you get to move forward. Um, and then at the end of the day, the event's open. You can go, and if you go into events, you can go into people, and you could find whoever is there. You can have conversations directly with them, find them through their LinkedIn's. You can go to expo booths from all our partners and our sponsors. Um, and so this is kind of the, the platform. This is it. Um, let's get started. Um, you know, since I did mention that this is in partnership <coughs> with the, the British Embassy, uh, the British Council, uh, and the UK government from a very variety of sides, uh, I would like to bring up the British Ambassador to Israel, uh, Mr. Neil Wigan, to come up and share a few words. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Hi, Cody, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? We can hear you fine. Great. So, uh, so first I want to say that this is a, an event that we at the Embassy are really excited about. It's the first event that we've done uh, in this area. Uh, and so I'm delighted that we've got such a great platform uh, of speakers and panelists from, uh, from Israel, from the UK, from the private sector, from the government, uh, from academia. So I'm sure it'll be a, a really good and useful event, and I'm grateful that everyone's putting their, their time into it. Uh, and we're really pleased to be working with, with Cody and his team at Ignite, uh, and Wendy and her team at Startup Nation, uh, to try to make this a, a really useful uh, and important event for everybody. Um, as you probably all know, but all, as you certainly will know by the end of this event, um, Clean energy uh, is at the heart of the British government's agenda. Uh, our Prime Minister has set out uh, for 2021 uh, a 10-point plan, a uh, 10-point green plan for how we build, build back better, how we build back greener uh, after the corona epidemic. Uh, and clean energy sits uh, right at the heart of that, whether it's uh, greater use of wind power, more efficient energy grids, looking at hydrogen cells, uh, increasing the rollout of electric charging points, uh, storage solutions. We think that uh, clean energy and the technological solutions around it um, are right at the heart of that agenda for us in the UK. Um, energy is also at the heart of our, our international agenda. As you will all know, we're hosting in Scotland at the end of this year, uh, the UN Climate Change uh, event and that's going to be we think one of the biggest events on the international agenda this year where we hope to achieve uh, a real step change in progress towards uh, reducing climate change tackling its consequences uh, and helping the world use uh, technology raising financing um, in order to address all of those issues 
And again, we're absolutely clear that, that energy and technological solutions around energy challenges uh, are absolutely at the heart of that, that event. So at the embassy, we have taken our work on, on environmental issues, on, including on energy, which really was a very limited area of work for us and for our partnership with Israel, now sits right at the heart of our partnership with Israel. So teams from uh, the UK Israel Tech Hub at the embassy, from the British Council, from our Department for Trade and Industry, uh, and our Science and Innovation Network team, as well as political officers, uh, are all working together uh, with the Israeli government, with Israeli scientists, with the Israeli private sector uh, and tech companies to see how we can build uh, a really close relationship with Israel uh, across uh, those issues. So what we're talking about today is, is at the heart of our agenda because we believe that uh, the technologi technological uh, ability that we have in the UK, uh, what we're trying to do and what Israel is trying to do presents a really good fit and a good opportunity for cooperation uh, between both countries. Um, and at the heart of that sort of plan for cooperation uh, and the way of, of making it real um, is the World Clean Growth Alliance, which uh, is, a, is a new program for us. It's our flagship project in this area. Uh, and I chair the board on it because I think it's uh, so important. Uh, and it's really directly relevant to the event today. So it offers a, uh, it's a program that offers a chance to bring together uh, researchers, private sector, government, technology transfer teams um, to, you, to, to bring cutting edge research to bear on providing technological solutions uh, through every stage uh, of the, the research process. So it's a very open platform and we're looking to get uh, used today in other events to get people to, to sign on to it. So Cody talked about um, uh, the Hopin platform. So I would really strongly encourage people to, um, to visit the World Booth, which is part of the platform today, uh, to uh, pose questions, to pose challenges, uh, and to try to see how you can get involved uh, in that network. Uh, I've realized I've done the fatal ambassador trick of uh, talking for too long already, so I will stop on that, uh, hand back to, to Cody, um, but I wish you all uh, a really useful set of talks today and look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, Cody. Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I really do appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> and don't worry about it, you didn't take that long, and it was, it was a lot of val invaluable information. As he brought up again, we have the expo booths, um, which is something that's really nice to have. Um, go check those out afterwards, and those will be open for the next three days. Um, as I realized, I was muted, and so I've already given my full speech, but let's briefly discuss what Ignite the Spark is. Uh, Ignite the Spark is an Israeli grassroots energy tech innovation community. Our goal is to support energy technology, both on the domestic and international front. Uh, we do, um, you know, micro meetups, we do very specific meetups, we have um, folks on investors, we could focus on the actual specific technologies, maybe hydrogen, battery storage, we get CEOs together to then meet with energy consultants. We want to help solve the problems. And one of the things that we understand in today's world is that COVID-19 is going to pass. We see the vaccination rates increasing globally. Israel obviously is a front leader in this and leading the, 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 the race. Um, but climate change, energy technology, you know, if in what we believe with Ignite the Spark is if one of these companies can succeed, it could be a game changer in the way that we consume energy and the future of our planet. Um, very briefly, I want to share with you something that we did with our partner right before I bring them up. This is the Israeli innovation ecosystem when it comes to energy technology. This map is available on our website, which uh, I believe my co-founder Eshel posted at ignitethespark.org.il for you to go ahead and download. And it's a fully interactive map. Um, there's different categories that we broke this down into. You, these are all the companies that are based here in Israel that have a startup nation uh, finder profile as well. Startup Nation um, Central has been an unreal partner. 
um, in everything that we do. They've supported us in, in an immense way. And so I'd love to bring up their executive director of Startup Nation Central, Wendy Singer, to come right ahead and share um, more about her organization and what she does. Great, thanks, Cody. And a, and a special hello to Ambassador Wigan and Hadar and all our friends at the UK Israel Tech Hub. So first a word about Startup Nation Central. Uh, we are a nonprofit that was born about eight years ago in order to connect Israeli tech and innovation with global challenges. One of the key ways that we do that is through a platform that we launched called Startup Nation Finder. It's essentially a mapping of the entire Israeli tech ecosystem. It's got all the startups, all the R&D centers, all the VC hubs, and even the technology coming out of academia. So this whole thing is online and free, startupnationfinder.org. And I invite all of you to just hop on and have a look. It's a great way to kind of scratch under the hood in terms of what's happening in the energy and sustainability sector. Now, for us at Startup Nation, this event is an ultimate connection between two worlds that we see as strategic for the Israeli ecosystem. On the one hand, you have the energy tech sector, which has been developing at an impressive clip. And at SNC, we're seeing this very clearly. It's the number of global corporates that are reaching out, the extent of the deal flow, or the new companies and startups that have been popping up. All of this, of course, is thanks to a highly supportive network, which has been evidenced by the community that Ignite the Spark has built. So, Cody, you're an unreal partner as well. And then you have the UK market, which is also seeing lots of change. A pessimist might perceive that as turmoil or even chaos, but we Israelis only see a new window opening. One of the iconic entrepreneurs in the uh, Israeli tech sector is uh, Nadav Safrir, and he was quoted in a book called Chutzpah saying, we believe the most creative innovation happens at the edge of chaos. So there you have it. When you bring together innovation in the energy sector, the UK market to one event, there must be a real business opportunity to be explored. In terms of exploring, I invite any of you to reach out to my colleagues, Jeremy Kletzkine and Michal Saror, if you'd like to further uh, look into any of these topics. And with that, I wish all of you a productive and eye-opening three days ahead. Back to you, Cody. Thank you, Wendy, and for the kind words. And by the way, Startup Nation Central, they have a booth as well. So make sure you go check out their expo booth. Um, as you saw, Micha, they, they posted the Finder link, so you can go and check it out. It's not just for the energy sector. As we realize, uh, this is a multi-dimensional uh, approach. You know, energy technology is then paired up with Industry 4.0, and then it's paired up with e-mobility. It goes across the board at the end of the day. Uh, so then you're able to see companies that, you know, that can potentially do business, and at the end of the day, networking. This is what we're here for. And this is a both sides of the coin. Um, we have the Israeli side and we have the UK side. Um, so first, I just very briefly, I'd like to bring up the Deputy Director General for Planning Policy and Strategy for the Israeli Ministry of Energy, Sharon Hatzor, so for a few brief words. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues, friends, and partners, and I'm honored to be here. And, and I will take uh, to take part of the uh, UK and Israeli um, energy talk. And first of all, I want to say thanks to the British Embassy and the Ambassador, also to Ignite uh, the Spark for organizing this great event. And I'll spend my two minutes uh, telling you a little bit about, about our Ministry of Energy uh, strategy and policy. So uh, in the next in the in the past uh, few years, the Israeli uh, Ministry of Energy is investing uh, greatly in uh, developing the Israeli energy sector to become cleaner, greener, and more efficient and, and competitive, uh, all while uh, encouraging uh, creativity and innovation and, of course, the uh, breakthrough uh, technologies. So the Israeli Ministry of Energy is promoting the, uh, uh, transition, the transition from the uh, usage of uh, pollution, uh, polluting uh, fuels 
towards solar energy and other clean environmentally free energy sources. Uh, the ministry main goals over the next two years are to phase out completely the use of uh, coal by 2025 and increase the use of renewable energy resources uh, to at least 30% by 2030. And uh, those steps together with uh, a massive uh, reform um, that we have in, in our electricity sector are uh, making a huge, uh, huge shift in our energy sector. So as you all know, um, Israel is a very small country and our obstacles to move forward renewable are a bit different. Uh, we indeed have uh, a lot of uh, sun, but we are lack of uh, hydro and, and wind energy. And uh, we have lack of land uh, alongside with a uh, high population uh, growth. Uh, and it's very notice noticeable. Um, therefore, energy storage uh, tech, uh, technologies and other tech solutions are critical for our uh, ability to move uh, behind our current goals. Uh, as part of our policy in minimizing uh, the use of, of polluting fuels uh, is to make a change in the transportation sector. We set up goals and our ministry is uh, investing in, in, in EV uh, charging points throughout the country in order to encourage customers to purchase electric vehicles. Um, all, and also of course, uh, the ministry is investing greatly in R&D a project as well as in academia researches. Um, as, as I mentioned already, uh, uh, we believe that the technologic uh, breakthrough and innovation is the future and will get us um, to our ambitious goal. Um, we also believe that energy collaboration are the bridge to a sustainable Middle East uh, the transition to locally produced natural gas had a great impact on promoting cooperation and economic uh, relation with our neighbors. The neighbors are uh, Israeli exporting uh, natural gas to Egypt and Jordan. And alongside uh, with natural gas export, uh, we also promote various of the regional uh, initiatives such as the international grid connections. So just to summarize, um, I can say that there are uh, many challenges that we have uh, to go through in order to gain our target in the next 30 years. But I believe that the huge step that um, we've made in the past few years uh, will encourage and motivate uh, all of us to make even a bigger step in the near future. So um, thank you very much for, for um, inviting me and I'm really happy to be here. And of course, I'll be happy to be in touch with all of you and, and have a great time. And thank you very much and shalom. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate it. And I think uh, she definitely does discuss the all-encompassing aspect of uh, energy technology and the integration across multiple uh, facets and multiple sectors. Um, what I would like to do is now hear from the UK side. So for the head of energy and strategy for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, I'd like to bring up Mr. Adam Bell. Thanks, uh, Cody. Apologies for the clunk department. Um, the ambassador's already spoken about the Prime Minister's 10-point plan, but I want to give you a bit of a sense of the scale of our ambition in this space as well. It goes beyond um, even, even now this, this decade. Um, <clears throat> so if you pluck someone from about 30 years ago in 1991, put them in the UK today, the energy system would look pretty much still use power our, our cars using fossil fuels. We still use natural gas to heat our homes. And, and the bulk of our electricity still comes from fossil. There's an increasing proportion of renewables. But in well, 29 years' time, all of that is going to have to change. And it's an enormous infrastructure challenge. It's difficult to underplay how much what that, that means. It means the enormous expansion of low carbon electricity, wind, nuclear, solar, hydrogen generation too. It means rebuilding our industry to use, um, if, if not, well, no, not use fossil fuels, but um, also to use carbon capture and storage for those processes like steel making that rely upon the carbon component of the fuel. It means electrifying our like vehicles and converting heavier transport like ships and planes and boats to use different so sorts of uh, fuels too. And it means changing the way in which we heat our homes. But it also means, and this is particularly relevant, I think, for an awful lot of tech people on this, on this call, digitizing our system. Currently, our system is relatively analog in the 50s and 60s. Um, and it's not necessarily set up for anything other than a chap with a control center so Warwick calling a power station and saying, can you please turn down your output now? All the, all the electric heating devices, all the electric vehicles we can install across the country will radically change how that system works. Data will flood in from our consumers, from their cars, and their, their ability to control and modulate their demand will really 
and help us move towards a more, a more heavily renewable system. This is going to be a radical change. It's a change in the direction of travel, of flows of energy from the system, a change in the way in which consumers see themselves too. And they will have a strong part in getting us towards net zero. But of course, doing all this is going to require an enormous amount of innovation. And it's because of that, I'm really, really excited to see what we can do um, uh, working, to, working together on this agenda. Thank you, Cody. Adam, thank you so much. And I think you you touch on that, and 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 I think everyone has touched on it uh, in general. Is that it's the future? It's it's you know trying to solve problems together um, and doing it in a way that it's going to take a lot of joint effort across the board and future trends and the way that we're moving forward. I couldn't think of anyone better. Uh, I know my co-founder is a huge fan. Uh, he actually made me a fan as well of our keynote speaker. Um, he hosts a podcast, The Fully Charged Show, um, and I'd like to bring him up, uh, Mr. Robert Lewin. Today is actually, just so everyone knows, today is Robert's birthday, um, so make sure that everyone sends him a message wishing him a happy <laughs> birthday. Um, but Robert, happy birthday, and I'd love to hear from you, and, 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 and I think the entire audience would love to hear about your views on the trends and, and what we are seeing today, and I'll turn the stage over to you. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you, Cody. Thank you. I wish I hadn't mentioned my birthday. I just kept getting lots of messages when I first logged in. Um, it, 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 I'm very old. I'll just leave it there. Uh, this is an enormous privilege. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, really appreciate uh, the, the, the time you're giving me for, to do this because it is, you know, a, a deep joy in the latter section of my life to be uh, up to my neck in these topics. It was an unexpected turn of events that got me here. It's a very long story. I won't bore you with it. But what I think I'd like to briefly do is look back at the last 10 years, because as Adam just said, you know, if you were if you were to jump from 1991 to now, you, you might not immediately notice any differences, but actually there are some really profound ones that, and that's partly what my, what drives me to make this series is, is the fact that things are changing and the general public are often not aware of it. Uh, particularly, for instance, offshore wind, the very fact that it's offshore, we don't see it. 99% of the people in this country don't look out at sea from their houses and notice on the horizon there's a lot of wind turbines. So we're not aware of the, app, the huge impact that's made on our energy system. But so I want to look quickly back at the last 10 years. So when I first uh, had was driving an electric car regularly, which was uh, now about 12 years ago, there was one rapid charger uh, within the, within, within, in the United Kingdom, one. And it was behind a locked gate. So you had to ask permission to, to use it. And it very often didn't work. There is now uh, 22,410, I had to check. Uh, publicly available rapid charges in the country, and that will triple, I think, in the next couple of years. So a huge change uh, that we've seen in that particularly, uh, particular area. The, the UK government's announcement last year of the, the, the end of sales of combustion engine vehicles by 2030 is a remarkable uh, a political statement to make. And I'm really proud that the government have done that. I'm very supportive of the fact that they've done that. There will be a lot of kickback. A lot of people are moaning about it, but I think it's going to hold. And I think people will see the, the general population, I think, are really coming around to it because I think that's one of the critical things that's changed in the last 10 years. I do a lot of public speaking about this. I'll rephrase that. I did a lot of public speaking about this until the last year. Uh, and, and what I'm very aware of is the public reaction to the notion of electric vehicles and renewable energy, two really intrinsically linked topics and, and, and technologies. Ten years ago, it was electric cars don't really work. They look awful and you have to throw the batteries away after three years. Jeremy Clarkson told me that they're, they're rubbish and they just don't work. That was the, the reaction ten years ago. And some of that was based on, you know, fairly, there was very limited amount of electric cars. There was nowhere to charge them. And they were very expensive. And who knew how long the batteries would last? No one did. We hadn't ever used that technology in that role before. So there was no there was no way of knowing. We now know slightly differently. And slowly, that knowledge has sort of seeped into the general uh, population's consciousness. So now what I hear is I'd love an electric car. I wish I could have one. But 
they're too expensive or they're still too expensive or they don't tow caravans. It's a very common one. Now there's lots of electric cars that can tow caravans and there aren't enough public chargers. And so that's those are all very legitimate uh, problems. And I think they're, they're also the good thing about that is they're also all solvable problems. Without question, the price of new electric cars is coming down. And without question, the number of public chargers is going up. So those there will be solutions to that. I've always said electric cars are not the solution to all our problems. They won't solve the world's energy crisis. They won't solve the CO2. They, they are a step in one very important step, but a small step in the right direction. And the main thing that all the people I've spoken to who have electric cars is it makes them aware of where the energy they use comes from, which I have to say, as a person who drove combustion cars for 45 years, never occurred to me. Didn't even think about it ever. So it, that, that is true. So what I would like to quickly look at is what will definitely happen in the next 10 years and what I would really love to and might happen in the next 10 years. So I think we will see a very rapid increase in the adoption of electric vehicles in very specific areas. Uh, private vehicles, certainly, without question, but I think that's going to be a slow but steady increase. There'll be an endless number of new vehicles available. Uh, back in 2011, we, I worked out there was three or four commercially available, virtually viable electric cars that you could buy, and they were all quite expensive. None of them went terribly far. There's now over 75 different models of pure electric vehicles available in the European market, many of them in the UK. So we're very blessed in that sense. Um, uh, the, in 2019, the Wall Street Journal calculated that car makers had publicly pledged that they would spend $225 billion over the next 10 years developing new technology in electric cars. I think we can say that's quite a big commitment. The areas that I see growing fastest, last mile delivery, without question. Two days ago, I had my first delivery. I live in a remote rural area. It's a long way from anywhere. And I had my first delivery uh, from a, a well-known international delivery company. <laughs> they don't need any more publicity in an electric van with their logo emblazoned on the first time. I, if I lived in a city, I wouldn't be surprised about that, but I'm living in a fairly remote rural area. That van had to travel 40 or 50 miles, you know, doing deliveries to get to my house. So that was really impressive that they that, that's, that is slowly happening. And I think we will see that happening very fast. A good example of that is a company in America called Rivian, who everyone is aware of that's into electric cars. They're making cool pickup trucks that are really powerful and fast. They've just increased, uh, Amazon have just increased their order uh, for electric delivery vans from 100 to 150,000 units. And they're already producing these. That's where they're making the money. We're going to see an enormous uptake of uh, urban delivery vehicles, urban public transport, taxis. They will be electric way, way before most people are driving electric cars. Uh, the other area that I didn't expect to see is uh, electric plants. So diggers, uh, earth movers, bulldozers, really big, large electric plant. We're starting to see those come onto the market. There's a quarry in Sweden now that the entire fleet of, of uh, machinery they use on this quarry is electrically powered. So huge, now, and we're talking massive trucks, trucks that can carry 50 tons of rock, huge diggers, huge hydraulic diggers, it's just electric motors and batteries instead of diesel engines. So that's happening. Uh, I've actually had two electric diggers at my house making a mess of my garden, so I know they work. And then fleet vehicles, I think, is the other area that we're, from the people we, we've spoken to, a very rapid adoption. So uh, companies that supply fleets of vehicles for their employees, it's so easy for them to trans transfer their uh, purchasing power. So it won't be one or two cars, it'll be hundreds. And that is happening already. Um, uh, uh, okay, another one which I think is really interesting that we filmed a, a garbage truck, a, we call them a dustbin lorry, uh, fully electric, so much quieter than the diesel ones that come around and pick up your bean, bins and do all the recycling. Uh, and that we, we followed one that was being tested by various council areas in the in the UK. Uh, and there was one electric truck. Well, um, Manchester City Council have just started using 28. They bought 28 of them and they're using them as regular bin lorries. So they're, they're, this technology, the, the changeover is very rapid. Once it's, well, I've waited years for the first bin lorry and now 28 come along at once. Uh, 
so the other area that a lot of people talk about is fully autonomous vehicles. I've had the privilege of being uh, driven around in two hundred percent fully autonomous vehicles. Incredible technology. I felt very safe. I still think it's five years away. The the energy consumption of the computing power needed to make that possible was enormous. It reduced a Nissan Leaf with an average urban driving range of say. 150 miles to 40 miles. It had 40 miles range because it was running this vast array of very space hungry uh, electronics and computers in the back. Now that was three years ago. That will already have been shrunk down, but I think we've got a lot of a lot of places to go. The, the technology I've seen that really inspired me was again last mile delivery, fully autonomous last mile delivery for cities so that you you get a call and you go down outside your apartment or your house and there's this little box on wheels and it's got a special door with your package in and that door opens and you take your package out and it goes off somewhere else that i can see coming much faster they're low speed they only do a local area of delivery they don't have drive safe and reliable at that level that sort of machinery is very very uh, you know plausible um the other area that we've become incredibly aware of in the last few years, and I'm sure this is the case, I'm sure many of you will be aware of this, is the Chinese uh, automotive manufacturing uh, development. It's happened so quickly, kind of behind, we haven't really been aware of it, but there's companies now that are producing really competent, really well-made electric cars that are 20,000 pounds cheaper than a Tesla and basically do the same job. They go the same distance, they're the same speed, they're the same size. And, you know, there's a lot of dis criticism of them that they've just stolen the technology. I think if you steal the technology and make something worse, that's really, really annoying. If you use the technology as a guide and make something better and cheaper, it's a very difficult argument. And I think the biggest challenge to the European, the established European and North American automotive industry, which is huge, uh, is is from China, I think, more than anything else. And uh, there are more. The, what, a very popular electric car in the UK is the MG uh, uh, um, SE electric vehicle, which is 100% uh, electric, really, really solid, uh, has a really high safety rating and is 100% Chinese. And I've seen them on the road all over the place. They're very popular. So often we won't even know we've got a Chinese car. Um, the, the, so the increased use of rapid chargers and what's changing in the technology of rapid chargers is really fascinating. I've just used a new rapid charger that's installed uh, near a, a freeway, near a motorway, near where I live, and they are capable of, of delivering 450 kilowatts. And that would be a sort of power that there's no car yet that's built that can take that, but they've built the charging infrastructures that can deliver it. So when someone does do that, and what you're talking about there is you're talking about adding say 150, between 150 and 200 kilometers of range in five minutes. That's the sort of technology that we're looking at that's already in the ground functioning. I charged my car that I was test driving on that charger and that charged at about 120 kilowatts and that was fast. So 450 kilowatts, that technology is really rapidly emerging and, and uh, being developed very well. There are now large charging hubs in the UK, which don't have to have such a large uh, grid connection because they have massive batteries on site that are being charged 24 hours a day. And those batteries then dump the power into the car through the, as, as they have at this one location, 38 rapid charges. So they can charge 38 cars at very high speed without melting the wires, as we were often told in the past. So that's what is happening in this country. I've just done an interview with an amazing Israeli company called RE, who are building, uh, many of you will know about what their, their work, it's extraordinary. So they're building electric platforms, skateboards they're called, four wheels and a battery pack and the control system that goes with that. They're building that so that car companies don't have to do that. They've specialized and built the best possible running gear you can put in a car. And then a car company can then build really cool body work and concentrate on that and make it look really cool. And the way that they've designed this, that rehab, so that you, the way that the parts of the vehicle are replaceable is genius. And I love this aspect of this, the, the liberation of, uh, of electric drivetrains have done to engineers and car designers. It's changed the whole dynamic of the industry. And I think in really, really exciting ways. And that's kind of what you we hope is gonna happen in the next 10 years. And I'm just hoping I haven't gone too far. I'm nearly finished. <laughs> 
here's a couple of really important points that I've really become aware of in the last 10 years. Currently, if, we, if you own a private car, if you own a car yourself, it's not being used for 95% of the time that you own it. There may be exceptions of people who drive a lot. Then it goes down to 90% of the time you own it. The rest of the time, it's just sitting there doing nothing. If you have a petrol or diesel vehicle, it's literally useless while you're not using it. If you have an electric car, there are emerging some really important uses vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, vehicle to load, all those things make that car slightly more useful during its lifetime. And there's a lot of debate about how that affects battery life, but there's an, a lot of evidence to say it actually is beneficial to battery life. So that is an important key point, but you still got to think, is that the right way of approaching the problem? That's the way the automotive industry is. Don't buy a diesel car, buy one of our electric ones, then you'll be fine still someone to sell us private cars. And I understand why that's what their business is built on. But it might be worth considering, particularly this is going to be a generational change. Do you really need to own a car? I, I would, would really appreciate having access to one and access to one that's fairly uh, you know, frictionless so that I can order a car on my phone and it arrives at my door and I get in and drive it. That technology is literally on our doorsteps at the moment. At the moment, the, out of the global population, about 18% of the global population own a car. Really small percentage. And there's no materials available on this planet for everyone. If everyone suddenly became middle class and wanted a car, there's no room to park them. There's no roads to drive them all on. And there's, not, there's no materials to make them. And I'm not talking the, the rare materials that are getting a lot of publicity, cobalt, nickel, all that. No, steel. Iron, <laughs> yeah, aluminium, there's not enough of it. So, so we've got to find a solution that allows us to use cars, because I think they're very useful, particularly in our weather in this country. Today, I do not want to go out on my bike. It's a horrible day. You know, it's lovely to have a car. So that is, it, it, we've got to find a sustainable way of using uh, a, a new form of transport and electric vehicles do lend themselves to that much more readily. And also autonomous vehicles that you never, you're never driven by an autonomous vehicle. This is the first step I see with autonomous vehicle, but you might be able to order one and it drives to you with no one in it. As soon as you do that, and this is insurance companies that have explained this, as soon as you have a vehicle with no one in it, covering that vehicle from an insurance point of view is a lot more easily from, uh, easy. from a legal point of view, it's a lot easier. It only has to avoid other people. It doesn't matter what happens in the car. The car can destroy itself in extreme situations if it's going to kill someone. So it can choose between, you know, do I run over that old lady crossing the road or do I drive into this lamppost and smash myself to bits to save her, you know? And there's no one in the car. You don't have to worry about them. That's a whole other topic, but a very interesting one. Um, so I'm praying that in future generations, my son, for example, my daughter, they never own a car. They use them, they drive, it's no, you know, but they, when they stop driving, they just park them, leave them, and someone else uses it, or the car drives off and charges itself. We would be able, we would be able to do what we do now with about 10% of the number of cars on the road as we have now. So our cities would be liberated from that jammed up, loads of cars parked on half on the pavement, half on the street, all that stuff that we get in cities would be really transformative. So that might, might become a thing. Just quickly, I want to touch on batteries because we're very conscious that we use lithium ion batteries with the materials that they use. Uh, one of the th first things we're going to go and film when we're allowed to is at Manchester University Battery Research Department, where they have, I think I'm allowed to talk about this, and then there's a lot of this going on in Israel as well, where they have carbon on carbon batteries. So they function already as test batteries in a laboratory. And I think it's going to be probably five years before they're commercially available. But if they can produce this carbon on carbon batteries, what is in a carbon on carbon battery? Carbon. <laughs> that is it. There's nothing else. Uh, these are carbon fiber nanotubes that they've worked out how to do it. This is all to do with all this, you know, graphene, the graphene obsession that was in the press a few months, a few years ago, sort of disappeared. But it's disappeared because people are actually working to develop this revolutionary change this would make massive increase in energy density massive reduction in cost massive increase in life expectancy of those batteries and what do you do at the end of life with a carbon on carbon battery i did ask the people who are working on them they said you wouldn't really bother you'd throw it away because it's carbon it's not a toxic material uh it, well, this also allows larger vehicles to be uh to be uh battery powered which is already happening but and i think it will happen sooner than people think 
But it, once you get a, the next generation of battery technology, I think we can all see that there will be very major changes. So one of the things I used to hope was that we could have electrified ships. Some shipping was mentioned in the, in the list of big challenges we have. And it's certainly hydrogen fuel cells definitely has a, have a role there. Hydrogen as a, as a motivating fuel for big ships. Um, I had the privilege of filming on really big ships. They are really big. <laughs> they're not small, they're massive. You know, the engine is five times the size of my house. You know, they're big, big machines. And so it's a really big challenge to, to stop using fossil fuels to drive those machines those ships. Um, but one of the things we're going to see this year is a large offshore wind support ship, a, server, a ship that goes out to service offshore wind turbines. Uh, and that is being converted to a battery electric ship. And this is bigger than a boat. It's not a huge, uh, you know, ocean going container ship, but it's a large ship and it will be 100% powered by battery. And one of the things they're working on, which I just think is such a cool idea is what have you got in a wind turbine out in the North Sea? You've got electricity. So they're trying to work out how while the ship is docked next to a wind turbine, it can be also charging from the power that wind turbine is generating or from a nearby one that is generating. So those things are very exciting. One of the things I never expected to see 10 years ago, and I'm rounding up now, if anyone's getting, if anyone's getting tense, very near the end, but this is so exciting. I never expected, I never thought about, it never occurred to me when I was first driving electric cars and then I could see that mo electric motorbikes or electric delivery vans, all those things were very visible 10 years ago. What was totally out of the picture was electric flight. And uh, the first two things we are filming later this month in the UK are electric aircraft. One of which has flown over 450 miles already. It's a 12 seater, it's still quite small, 12 seater. The other one is fascinating, developed by Rolls Royce. They have an enormous array of electrically powered flying machines being developed. Now, some of those we've, we've had to sign NDAs, we're not allowed to talk about them, but the one we are allowed to talk about, we've already seen, is a Red Bull aerobatic plane. And the peculiarity of this particular piece of technology is the, the electric Red Bull aerobatic plane, which will be flown this year can fly faster higher and longer than their petrol equivalents so they're more powerful they can fly for longer and they can fly higher the engines don't need uh, oxygen you know the a combustion engine needs oxygen in order to operate huge amount of heavy complex technology to make an internal combustion engine work at high altitude an electric motor doesn't mind it's not bothered and they are developing using that as a test bed to develop other things so they're developing the flight systems the motors the control systems the batteries to do that i never thought i'd see that and i genuinely now because uh, it's my birthday today i want to live at least another 10 years i'm trying to be fit and healthy because i want to be able to do a short haul passenger flight somewhere around europe in an electric plane i think it is possible i think we are going to see that this whole area, I haven't mentioned all the, the, the technology and renewables. One thing I just quickly want to say, because that's another one we're going to say, which could be very useful in Israel, is gravitricity. Just Google gravitricity. Just put gravity and tricity together. Gravitricity is a company in Scotland. Fairly obvious what they, they lift weights up. And then when they drop down, uh, it generates electricity. They've got a test uh, system going at the, in the docks in Glasgow now. Um, really exciting idea. They, they're talking about using them in old coal mines, but there are brilliant new ways of developing energy storage, which is the critical thing for renewables. The more electricity we've learned to store, the larger amounts we can store, not just in batteries, obviously they have a role, but there's millions of other ways. Obviously pump storage is the big one that Norway use, we use that to a certain extent, but there's so many other areas. But the other one I always want to say is, if we've got 10 million electric cars in the UK and 90% of them aren't being used, there's a big battery for you, widely distributed over the whole country. That applies to Israel in just as in exactly the same way. I don't want to talk anymore because I'm sure I've gone way over my time. I'm just being told if I'm not being told off. But that is all I have to say. Thank you so much for listening and putting up with me. Oh, and watch Fully Charged. <laughs> of course, make sure that you subscribe. Watch Fully Charged. Robert, um, I wish you don't say that. You're going to live longer than 10 years, but let's make sure <laughs> these trends within the next 10 years. And if not, even yeah. sooner, within the next five years, I think. Um, so Robert, again, thank you so much. There was a lot to thank unpack you. there. This is going to be recorded. So as we said, there was a lot of great information. So we'll be able to share it with you again. So next steps from here, 
I want to ask that all our panelists go over to their uh, sessions and then all our attendees uh, go ahead and find your sessions. Um, there are three different sessions. If you look on the left, it says now sessions. Um, there is one for academia. There's one we'll be talking about unbundling. And then there's another one um, that is all about innovation and commercialization and talking about startups and how these companies did it. This is it for the main stage. Um, so go ahead and check out sessions. Uh, afterwards, uh, make sure you stick around for the speed dating networking. Um, so with that being said, thank you for sticking around for the main stage and go find your part, your, your sessions.